probably the biggest mistake people make in working in a hackamore, the two things. They, number one, they think because you have a hackamore, you don't do anything. You just put your hand down. Well, that's totally irrelevant to training a horse, so that's not true. But then the other thing, and I've been guilty of this myself, is don't ever let that horse get luggy. You know, you've got to be... You've got to understand the hackamore well enough to keep him off of it so that your timing stays good. You don't want him to just be noodly and giving under it like he would in a snaffle. That's not the purpose of the hackamore. But at the same time, if, if he's taking your timing away in the stop or in the turn because you're lugging on this hackamore, then you've you totally used it wrong and you're not doing any good training. That's why I said, I was, told J.D. I was come around here to tell him, hey, right in the middle of that turn, just give him a little hop, come here. And before I got here to tell him, he did it yeah. perfectly. Perfect timing, and that little horse jumped back. And then the next time he came over, he was right back through there. That's a, that was a great example of how to use that hackamore. Let him land, let him start to swing on his own, and then use that to just say, hey, come here to me. But if you get, if they get luggy uh, in that thing, then you have, to, you have to figure out something different, you know. But we all have a tendency with a snapple to do too much, so our application is a little overdone. That's the downside to a snapple. You could train one in a snapple just as well, just like some guys do. But we all have a tendency to to ask for more and be more in the mix with a snapple than we do when we stick an Ackmore on him and say, hey, I'm going to go stop, and then i got to let him start. Then I might assist him some, but he almost has to start on his own or he gets a little rigid in that Ackmore. So it makes us be a little more disciplined in waiting on that horse to make a decision. Yeah. It's a pretty moving little horse. Yeah, he is. I mean, this little dude is soft. He walks all the way through there just like right there. It's just no effort. You know, another thing, and I'm not just going to toot, and J.D.'s horn because he's here and we're on video, but, but I've noticed all them really great bronc riders have a respect for a horse that other people don't have and compassion. And J.D.'s all, that's one reason I'm so high on him. He's, he's a great horseman, but he still has that bronc rider respect for a horse. Yeah, so this being the cow, and this is me on the horse. Okay, so my cow turns, and as I'm coming through there, right here, I want to go to the cow's neck. So when I say that, I can direct my horse's head with my feet. So I want to take his head with my feet and stick his head into that cow's neck. So if she's ahead of me, I've got to ride all the way to there. By doing that, then I start to control the cow. If I just ride to the shoulder of the cow, then that cow's always controlling me wherever I go. If I ride out to the head of it, that cow's controlling me wherever I go. But if I stick his head in that cow's neck, now I've got control of her all the way across the pen. That pressure makes her get away from me. Okay, so that, that also goes all back to what we've talk, been talking about in the last two or three horses. If you go there and land, you're set up perfectly for that turn to pull your horse right with it. If, if you back here, that turn pushes you out here. If you're out there, that turn.